things. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Think with me for a moment. I don't ask you to speak out. This is not a time of confession. But think with me for a moment. Has there ever been a time, as you look over the history of our lives together, has there ever been a time when you felt alone, absolutely, frighteningly alone? It could have been the loss of a loved one. It could have been the betrayal of a friend. It could have been the loss of a parent. We all know these experiences. Perhaps the one that reigns highest in my mind was the loss of my dad. Mom had died some years earlier. She had been sick for a while, but dad was the glue that held the whole family together, the generations of the family together. He was like a bookend, and mom was too, like a bookend when I was having young children with Doris. When something came up, when there was a problem, I could pick up the telephone and say, hi mom, hi dad, what do I do? They were always the backbone, the backup, the encouragement, and once in a while a financial resource for this young family getting started. Then came the day, unexpectedly, when Dad passed away. Mom had been gone for a while. There were no bookends anymore. I, the young dad, was the back ends for my children. But where do I turn? What do I do? Where is the help? Where is the support? Where is that reassuring word? One time it was just, Ted, come and rest for a while. Pack up the kids and Doris and just come down for a while for a rest. There was no bookend anymore. On either side, we were alone. Being alone is a terrifying experience, and we all know that for many reasons. That's sort of weaving through all of these stories that we're reading today, the epistle, the gospel, even the shepherd in the 23rd Psalm who's out in the wilderness alone with his sheep. You know, as I've said before, and one time demonstrated that the shepherd made a corral and then put a gate in it and got the sheep inside the corral, and then the shepherd stretched out over the gateway. Jesus said, I am the gate of the sheepfold. Maybe that's where the phrase comes from, over my dead body you'll do that. <laughs> Who knows? But lurking in the fabric of the epistle and the gospel is this sense of people wandering and searching and feeling alone and feeling no hope and looking somehow somehow, for a father. Jesus said they're like sheep without a shepherd. As Bo Peep, as pastor brought us into this morning, is leaving them alone, the shepherd never does. The shepherd puts his body between danger and the flock. But these people were like, a sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. St. Paul writes to the Gentiles, for you remember how it was. You were like aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were apart from God. You were apart from hope. You were alone. And then God changed that by sending his son, so that we emerge together, you and us. This is St. Paul writing now to Jews and to Christians. And he has made us one, built into the commonwealth of heaven, all of that kind of thing. But the same message comes now in the gospel lesson as well. 
In the gospel lesson today, in the fifth chapter, we read, read from the sixth chapter today, but in the fifth chapter, midway through it, leading up to the sixth chapter, is the story of Jairus and his daughter dying. And when Jairus comes, he, he's the leader of the synagogue. And he comes and falls on his face before Jesus. And he said, if you would, my daughter is near death. So Jesus said, I will come. As he's going, a woman brushes against him in the crowd of people milling around him. And she touches his robe and he feels the touch. And Jesus says, who touched me? And his disciples said, are you nuts? Look at this crowd. Everybody's pressing on you. And you ask, who touched me? And then the woman comes forward and said, I did. She said, hemorrhage of 12 years. You want to know what feeling alone feels like? She's been thrown out of the synagogue because the issue of blood made her unclean. She cannot come to the synagogue. She cannot live in a Jewish community. She cannot live without isolation. She is alone. She's healed and Jesus goes on and then servants come and say, you don't need to trouble the master any longer because your daughter is dead. And Jesus turns to Jairus and says, did I tell you if you believe you'll see the glory of God? And they keep going. And Jesus kind of forces his way past the mourners and he says, make way She's not dead, she's sleeping. They laugh at him. He goes in, and we have this touching moment. He grasps her by the hand, and he says, Talitha Kuma, which means in Aramaic, little girl, I say to you, arise. The touch of the master's hand, the presence of the one in whom there is eternal hope, the touch of the master's robe for the lady with the hemorrhage of 12 years. And you know what? Matthew, Mark, Luke all tell that story. Oh, I said that there were these left out verses. In the left out verses, there's the feeding of 5,000. Jesus says, you might have wondered that he said these are like sheep without a, she without a shepherd. And he taught them many things. What it doesn't tell us because it wants to go on to the other issue is that he also fed them. 5,000 men. Mark is very clear about 5,000 men. So my mind starts playing games. That may be bigger than we have ever believed it was because there might have been children. Luke tells us there were children. In fact, it was a little boy that gave the five loaves and the two fish. So then maybe it's 10,000. Or if the mother of the household had come along, let's guess 15,000. It doesn't matter. 5,000 impresses me. There were only five barley loaves and two fish and 12 baskets of leftovers. It doesn't need to be any more than 5,000. I'm impressed. But the issue again is the crowd. Always the crowd. The crowd, the crowd, the crowd, and Jesus is not even time to eat. And Jesus is saying, let's go for another deserted place. And they go to Genesaret, and the people have followed them there. And as soon as they know where he is, they start bringing the sick from the villages and the towns and the farms, and they bring them to the marketplaces and stretch them out on mats. And then they beg him, saying, Remember what they said? Touch us and make us whole. Or let us just touch your robe. Remember the lady with the hemorrhage? Let us just touch your robe and we will be healed. What is life worth? And where are we going that's worthwhile? if we don't have the Savior. It's that touch of Christ that changes our lives and motivates us to change other lives as Christ has promised. Sixty years ago, I heard a preacher who was the name of, heard a preacher who was the name of 
Burl Maurer, who was an assistant to the president of the Senate in those days, who read a poem that's a little quirky, but I thought it might be appropriate. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bidding, good folks?' he cried. "'Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, two, or two, or maybe and only two, two dollars for this violin? Who'll make it three? Three dollars, once three dollars, twice three dollars, going for three, but as he was speaking from the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow, then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as caroling angels might sing. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for this old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand, once, three thousand, twice, and going and going and gone. The people cheered, but some of them cried, we do not quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came the reply. It was the touch of a master's hand. Now many a man with his life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap at the th to the thoughtless crowd, much like an old violin. A mass of porridge, a glass of wine, a game, and, I tra and he travels on. He is going once and going twice and going almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never quite understands the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Now you and I sit here and say, but where is that touch for us? Where is that moment for us when we have been touched and we have been changed and the worth of our soul and the hope of our lives are all bound up in the touch of that hand. Well, it happened here, and it's happened elsewhere, but it has happened for us all. It's been the touch of the Master's hand. The pastor ascribed the cross on our head and said, you have been marked with the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ forever. We've been bound into the household of God. We are the person where God, we are the temple where God dwells. That's us. We were made the apostles. By the way, Mark's the only gospel that refers to the disciples as apostles. We became the apostles, the representatives, the missionaries. That's really the name for apostle, word for apostle. We became the missionaries of Christ. Much of us have lost that. Much of us like it just the way it is with our friends. But we are the missionaries. We are the ones who bring the touch of that master's hand to others, who not only speak of the Christ who comes into this world, but we speak of the Christ through our actions that bring salvation to the rest of the world. This morning, in the Shepherd's Hall, we'll hear from Lutheran World Relief. We also know about Lutheran World Action that did the refugee resettlement after World War II so huge we not only spoke Christ, the discipline of Christ demanded that the church, you and I, care for others. You know, once we get caught up in caring, our lives change too. I had a, a good friend have a good friend on the trustee board of Roanoke College whose husband was most blessed in the stock market and he loved to give the money away. And he says, people, if people just knew how good it feels to give it away, they'd be rushing to hand it out. As we practice being apostles, 
as we practice the touch of the master's hand and the brokenness of our world, be it our neighborhoods, our families, our church, another continent, as we learn the joy of generosity in being Christ to others, guess what? We begin to know what it feels like to be the living place for God in us. It's not just the touch of the master's hand in Palestine. It's the touch of the master's hand through us that gives thousands upon thousands of people hope. Be sure today you take time to hear the story of hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.